counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Just 10 miles from Minneapolis, a new deadly police shooting sparking shock, disbelief, and anger. Tonight, police are calling it a fatal mistake, but protests are expected across the country tonight. The sports world also taking notice. Basketball, baseball, and hockey games canceled. So many collectively thinking, here we go again. In the midst of this new tragedy, my community is um, reliving the trauma of the murder of George Floyd. And more emotion tonight at the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin. And being around him, he showed us like uh, how to treat our mom and how to respect our mom. He he just he loved her so dearly. George Floyd's brother taking the stand. An alarming rise in COVID cases in the Midwest. Tonight, the governor of Michigan pleading for more vaccines. The CDC says vaccines won't help what's happening right now. Nationwide, all states are dealing with an 85% drop in Johnson & Johnson vaccines this week. Nuclear sabotage. Tonight, Iran vowing revenge after reports Israel may have caused a blackout at Iran's uranium enrichment facility that could set their nuclear program back months. From bad to worse, a growing humanitarian crisis tonight. The huge eruption rocking the Caribbean island of St. Vincent. The message tonight for anyone who did not evacuate, get out now. The second most polluting company in the world should not be running multi-million dollar ads telling consumers that they are good for the environment. Many times companies say they have grand plans to go green, but critics say the reality can be far different. Our report on greenwashing. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Just 10 miles away from the murder trial of former officer Derek Chauvin, another deadly police shooting has ripped open wounds from last May, sparking new protests about use of police force in America. Dante Wright now joins the ranks of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude, and a host of others who have lost their lives after interactions with police. And we're now getting a look at the body camera video of the incident in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, where police say the officer accidentally shot the 20-year-old thinking it was a taser instead of a handgun. This latest shooting has only exacerbated the situation in the Twin Cities area tonight, where tensions were already high because of the Derek Chauvin trial. A curfew will be in effect tonight in that area where more protests are expected. Tonight, President Biden weighing in saying Americans should listen to Dante's mom who has called for peace and calm. Our Stephanie Ramos leads us off tonight. Tonight, new body camera video showing the moment a Minnesota officer fatally shot 20-year-old Dante Wright. Police say the female officer, a veteran on the force, accidentally discharged a gun instead of a taser, killing the father of a two-year-old. It is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. This was an accidental discharge that resulted in the tragic death of Mr. Wright. The incident beginning just before 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon when authorities say Wright was pulled over for an expired vehicle registration outside of Minneapolis. Wright's girlfriend also in the car. According to the Brooklyn Center Police Department, the officers ran Wright's name through their system, discovering there was a warrant out for his arrest. Court records show that warrant was issued after Wright failed to appear in court earlier this month, following charges of possessing a firearm without a permit and running away from law enforcement. Police say on Sunday, Wright was trying to get back into the vehicle as officers attempted to apprehend him. The officer warning, I'll tase you. Then she pulls a firearm, firing a shot at Wright. The car driving for several blocks before crashing into another vehicle. According to authorities, paramedics tried to save his life, but Wright was pronounced dead at the scene. 
Tonight, the officer who pulled the trigger is on administrative leave pending an independent investigation. We cannot afford to make mistakes that lead to uh, the loss of life. And so I do fully support uh, releasing the officer of her duties. Overnight, protests erupting. Tensions already high in the city with the trial of Derek Chauvin just 10 miles away. Our hearts are aching right now. We are in pain right now. And we recognize that this couldn't have happened at a worse time. President Biden weighing in. We do know that the anger, pain, and trauma that exists in the black community in that environment is real. It's serious and it's consequential. We should listen to uh, uh, Dante's mom, who is calling for peace and calm. Dante's mother, heartbroken. They don't want all of this, all of this. I just want my baby home. That's all I want. Yes, I want him to be home. I don't want everybody out here chanting and screaming and yelling. I just want him home. A mother just wants her son home, her pain so palpable. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, the governor of Minnesota announced a curfew for the Twin Cities. What details do you have on that? Yes, Lindsay, so that curfew goes into effect tonight at 7 o'clock until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning in multiple cities, including Minneapolis and right here in Brooklyn Center where we are. It'll be interesting to see how officers are able to clear uh, the crowds that have already gathered. You can see a crowd of protesters gathered outside the Brooklyn Center Police Department behind me. Now, police have said that communities will see an increased presence of the Minnesota National Guard and other law enforcement. Lindsay. Really trying to crack down. All right, Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. We're joined now by Democratic Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota. Senator, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I first would like to get your reaction to the announcement by the local police chief that this appears to have been an accidental shooting. What did you make of the video released of this incident and of the explanation of how this traffic stop led to Dante Wright's death? Well, this is it's another tragic example of um, a person of color, a black person engaging with law enforcement and ending up dead. It's a tragic error. It's a fatal error. We have to get to the bottom and take steps so that this doesn't happen again. You know, in, in my city of Minneapolis, we have about 40% of the community as people of color yet they are 74% of those that have um, interactions with the police where there's excessive use of force. Uh, traffic stops like this should not result in somebody's death, and it is, it's tragic. And as you know, the shooting sparked a night of unrest with police deploying tear gas as they cleared protesters from the streets. A curfew is now in effect for the Twin Cities metro area tonight. What's your message to residents of Minnesota who are furious about this happening again? Another shooting death of an unarmed black man by police. Well, I share, the, I share everyone's fury and everyone's anger, and I believe so strongly in um, peaceful demonstrations to make our voices heard so that action can be taken, both at the state level and at the federal level, where we have to make changes to policy so that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Uh, everybody, regardless of who you are, should be safe and feel safe in your home and your neighborhood and your community. And too often, that is not the case if you are black or brown or indigenous, a person of color. We also cannot have uh, violence and um, vandalism uh, that is um, damaging, sadly, often to those businesses um, that are often owned by people of color in the community, whether it's in Brooklyn Center, where Dante Wright uh, was killed, uh, or wherever it is in our community. And earlier today, you tweeted that Dante Wright was killed yesterday by law enforcement. We must act for accountability, for equity, to address the deep-rooted racism in our criminal justice system. We've heard you say uh, twice tonight that we have to make sure this doesn't happen again. But we've heard calls for action for the past year, and there's been little progress in Congress on police reform efforts. The White House did say today that it will focus on the passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So what would you say are the realistic prospects of this bill moving forward and getting passed by the Senate? 
Well, I'm an original co-sponsor of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, and it sets important limits on excessive use of force and bans uh, dangerous practices by law enforcement, and it also makes it easier to hold law enforcement accountable. Uh, and it, it needs to get passed. Um, I am, I gotta tell you, I am so frustrated. Uh, that we can't even bring this piece of legislation up on the floor of the Senate because of the threats of the filibuster by my colleagues. So the, the, the answer that in situations like this, there's always a reason why something like this happens. No, we have the responsibility as policymakers to take action, to get the kind of change that we need so that uh, policing is not so dangerous to black and brown people. You know, in Minnesota and in places all over this country, uh, people who are black or brown feel over-policed and underprotected, And we see, again, a tragedy like uh, like has unfolded for Dante Wright and his family. I, I think about my uh, experience and the tragedy of the death of Philando Castile in Minnesota, another black man who was driving and was stopped in a traffic uh, and a traffic stop and ended up losing his life. And I, I'm thinking about Philando's mother, Valerie Castile, and all of the mothers who've lost children uh, because of the systemic uh, inequities in our policing system. And, and you know, they're, of course, in Minneapolis, uh, which is just a few miles away from where this happened, uh, there's been an overhaul, really, already of the police system, and yet this has happened again. I'm not sure if those changes were also in effect there, but do you feel that at the local level there still needs to be more done with regard to policing and not just rely on, on Congress? That's right. There are big needs to make change at the local level in cities like Brooklyn Center and Minneapolis. There's also opportunities and um, leadership needed at the state level, where many of my former colleagues in the state legislature on the Democratic side are working hard to get those changes. You know, one of the things that we could do at the federal level is to support local innovation uh, to make uh, kind of new models for policing. Um, I have a piece of legislation that would help communities like Brooklyn Center uh, advance some of those innovations so that they can, for example, uh, do better de-escalation in situations that are potentially dangerous. Uh, for example, look at ways that you have uh, traffic stops involve law enforcement that are unarmed. There are many examples of innovation that are happening at the local level, and I think we could help um, spur that um, innovation and those new models, um, and that that's what my bill would do. And this, of course, is not happening in a vacuum, but as the trial of Derek Chauvin for the death of George Floyd is underway just a few miles away, any concern for you about the looming verdict in that trial coming as the community is now on edge over this shooting of Dante Wright? Well, exactly. As you say, in the midst of this new tragedy, my community is um, reliving the trauma of the murder of George Floyd. Um, I'm hoping that this time it will be different and those that were responsible for his death are held accountable. Uh, the Derek Chauvin trial has riveted the community and it has also uh, reminded us that we, in the tragic death of George Floyd, we started a movement for change in policing and law enforcement and we have to carry that forward. Uh, and uh, we, we cannot afford the loss of life that we see just too many times, including, again, in my community. Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota, we thank you so much for your time and talking with us tonight. Thank you so much. And of course, as we have already mentioned, as the death of Dante Wright reverberates across the country, just 10 miles away, the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin continues. Now in its third week, today, George Floyd's younger brother breaking down on the witness stand, talking about what his big brother meant to the family. Our Alex Perez reports in again from Minneapolis. Emotional testimony as the prosecution moves to wrap up their part of the case before the defense gets its turn. The jury today hearing from George Floyd's younger brother, Felonis Floyd, describing this photo. As my mother, she's no longer with us right now, but that's, that's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. 
In his final moments, George Floyd called out for his mother. On the witness stand today, his brother describing their relationship as one of a kind. He was a big mama's boy. Every mother loves all of her kids, but it was so unique how they were with each other. He would lay, just lay up onto her in the fetus position like he was still in a womb. He showed us like uh, how to treat our mom and how to respect our mom. He, he just, he loved her so dearly. The prosecution has called 38 witnesses, 10 of them doctors and other medical experts. Today, Dr. Jonathan Rich, a cardiologist, knocked down defense claims Floyd's drug use and heart disease led to his death. I can state with a high degree of medical certainty that George Floyd did not die from a primary cardiac event and he did not die from a drug overdose. He said officers passed up every opportunity to help revive Floyd. Do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether Mr. Floyd's death was preventable? Yes, I believe that Mr. George Floyd's death was absolutely preventable. Were there uh, critical points in time during, during his subdual and restraint on the ground uh, when you feel measures could have or should have been taken that would have preserved his life? Uh, yes, I do. I think there were several junctures, actually. A dozen members of law enforcement have testified against Derek Chauvin. Today, Seth Stoughton, a former officer and an expert on the use of force, summing up what so many others have said. No reasonable officer would have believed that that was an appropriate, acceptable, or reasonable use of force. Alex Perez joins us now from Minneapolis. Alex, deliberations could get underway as soon as next week. Yeah, Lindsay, and we expect the defense's case to be much shorter than the prosecution's. The judge telling the jury today that they should expect closing arguments on Monday and also telling them to pack a bag because they will be sequestered once deliberations begin. Lindsay? Alex Perez in Minneapolis for us. Thanks so much, Alex. And for more analysis of the trial, we bring in defense attorney Robert DiCello with the law firm DiCello, Levitt, and Gutzler. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with that emotional testimony from George Floyd's brother, Phil Anise. Here's a bit of it. Going back to growing up in the, in the, in the CUNY homes, uh, can you please tell the jury what role um, George Floyd had as, a, as the older brother in that household? He was so much of a, a leader to us in the household. He will always make sure that we had our clothes for school. He made sure that we all were going to be uh, to school on time. And like I told you, George couldn't cook, but he'll make sure you have a snack or something to get in the morning. What kind of impact do you think that this testimony has on a jury? And on the flip side, do you think at any point we'll hear any testimony that could potentially humanize Derek Chauvin? The impact that this testimony is going to have is, is just simply to humanize and give life to the man that was George Floyd. Um, of course, in 1985, Minnesota started this spark of life witness testimony uh, trend, as it were, within uh, Minnesota law. So the, the actual use of the testimony is to humanize and to give um, a perspective about this man who that, that goes beyond the, the struggles by the police car or the knee in the, in the, in the, in the neck. It's really about trying to give him a voice, frankly, for who he was as a human being, to give him dignity and to focus on who he was. As, as it relates to whether we're going to hear from Chauvin or about Chauvin, I doubt it. Uh, Chauvin has a right to remain silent under the Fifth Amendment. I suppose he's going to. And I doubt that anyone's going to come forward and just talk about him in, in, the, in the general sense as to what kind of man he was. Those That's really not going to be on the table. There could be someone test testifying about the kinds of um, procedures he used and how he was using them. And, and to that extent, we might hear about him, but I don't think we're going to hear the same kind of testimony. And today we also heard from a cardiologist called by the state, Dr. Jonathan Rich. Here's what he concludes. George Floyd died from a cardiopulmonary arrest. It was caused by low oxygen levels. And those low oxygen levels were induced by the prone restraint and positional asphyxiation that he was subjected to. Uh, I can state with a high degree of medical certainty that George Floyd did not die from a primary cardiac event, and he did not die from a drug overdose. 
And he's one of several medical experts to say that Floyd died, in fact, from low oxygen and not from his heart condition or a drug overdose. Do you think that cause of death is still an open question here? And could the defense still win the point on this? It's still an open question to the extent that the defense has a say in this. To this point, though, we've heard only what the prosecution has put forward. Now, this particular witness or this particular doctor, we all need to remember, is really the heart doctor of the case for the prosecution. His job is to tell us whether the heart itself was the reason for the death, whether the heart failed under many different circumstances. And to have him with us uh, to guide us through the testimony today was extremely helpful. We'll see if the defense has a response. And today, Judge Cahill refused to sequester the jury at this time, even as the city saw unrest over the police killing of Dante Wright. What was the defense concerned about? And do you think that the judge made the right call here? Well, the defense, look, the defense is having a lot of concerns right now. Um, I, I'm going to try to pull back for a second. There has been very, very, very little in the way of revealing cross-examinations, uh, bombshell testimony moments, uh, kind of gasping, um, you know, community discussion about uh, what's been said at trial. We've been seeing essentially the prosecution's case. The defense has not been able to push through it. And to the extent that the judge has ruled today, I think it's going to make things a little bit more difficult. I think the defense is worried very much so that they're going to not get their side of the case to the jury in a way that's very persuasive. Robert DiCello, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. As our country continues to try to get back to normal, that sense of normalcy is also accompanied by some unfortunate demons, one of those being school shootings. The latest took place this afternoon in Knoxville, Tennessee. ABC's Victor Akendo brings us more on the shooting that left at least one dead and injured an officer. Tonight, federal authorities are on the scene in Knoxville investigating a school shooting that left at least one person dead. Police responding to reports of an armed individual inside Austin East Magnet High School in Knoxville just after 3 p.m. Shots were fired as they approached. We are not sure exactly how many victims there are. We do know that multiple people have been shot, including a KPD officer. That officer shot at least once and taken to the hospital. The mayor telling our station WATE that the officer is conscious and alert. Authorities evacuating the school and locking down the surrounding area. One male pronounced dead at the scene, another male detained for further investigation. The governor reacting during a scheduled news conference late today. Pray for that situation and for the families and the victims that might be affected by that in our state. So many prayerful tonight. Victor Kendo joins us now. Victor, you also learned today that this shooting is part of a bigger problem at the school. How many other shootings have happened there? Lindsay, this school is no stranger to gun violence. Four teenagers who attended Austin East have been shot and killed in just the last few months. This community is shaken tonight. A family member of one of those victims saying they've suffered enough. Lindsay? Certainly have. Victor Kendo, our thanks to you. Shut things down. Those are the words the CDC director had for the state of Michigan as cases of COVID are up there by 18%. The governor of Michigan has declared her state a COVID hotspot and asked the federal government for more vaccines, but the CDC says that won't necessarily stop the spread. ABC's Eva Pilgrim brings us the latest on this surge. Tonight, an alarming rise in coronavirus cases now rivaling last summer's surge. Deaths now creeping up, too. Doctors in Michigan warning the virus there is burning like a wildfire. We're still seeing patients in critical condition. We're still seeing patients that are ending up on ventilators. The crush of COVID patients now forcing several Michigan hospitals to pause elective surgeries. The governor is pleading for more vaccine. We could get more vaccines in arms. More resources are on the way to Michigan. Michigan, but the White House COVID team today pushing back, saying a whack-a-mole approach with the vaccine supply won't work. The answer is not necessarily to give vaccine. In fact, we know that the vaccine will have a delayed re response. The answer to that is to really close things down, to go back to our basics, to go back to where we were last spring, um, last summer, and to, to shut things down, to flatten the curve. In Detroit, 40% of new cases are people between 20 and 40 years old. Health 
officials tell us there's enough vaccine. The challenge is getting people to take it. So are people just not wanting to get the vaccine? I think there's a lot of um, mistrust in the community. Young people, um, they feel as though they're invincible, um, that they are, they're healthy, they're not going to get sick, they're not going to get COVID. In Colorado, Shane Green is in the hospital on oxygen. I think the worst was not being able to breathe. It's really lonely in here. The 40 year old mother worries for other families as more restrictions are eased. It's very serious. And I don't think restrictions should be lifted over the weekend. A record number 4.6 million vaccines administered in one day, but states now facing a new hurdle. The supply of Johnson and Johnson this week plunges 85% after manufacturing delays. The fact that there will be you know, millions of doses not getting to people on schedule is going to be a problem for many states. That delay problematic for so many states, especially Michigan. Eva Pilgrim joins us now from Beaumont Hospital in Dearborn, Michigan. Eva, there's a new study out on the dominant strain of the virus. What have scientists learned? That's right, Lindsay. This new study just out today says that the UK variant is more transmissible, but it's unlikely that it causes more severe disease. Now, it's important to note that because this variant is more contagious, it can lead to more cases and, in effect, more hospitalizations and deaths. And that is why doctors are still so concerned. Lindsay? Understandably so. Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. Now to the explosion that caused a blackout at an Iranian nuclear facility this weekend. Iran's foreign ministry is saying that it will take revenge for the alleged attack on its uranium enrichment facility in Natanz, claiming Israel is behind it. ABC senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel joins us now. And Ian, the Iranians have provided some clues to what happened. What are they saying and, and what was the impact on this facility? Yeah, that's right. And interestingly, it only happened kind of later on in the day. Nothing from the top levels of government, but the man who used to be the head of the Iranian Atomic Energy uh, Agency Commission, uh, who now sits in the Iranian parliament and sits on their energy committee there, uh, did provide more detail. He said it was to do with the emergency power supply uh, that serves this uranium enrichment facility, uh, that the cables and the electricity supply had been targeted. He actually referred to the planning and execution of it as, quote, beautiful, and he meant that kind of in a scientific way. Uh, he felt that it was something that was very, very complex, what had been done. Uh, he wasn't very clear about whether it had been carried out by an individual down on the ground or it was something that had been planted there. But we know that there was some kind of incident, there was a blackout, uh, and it appears to have set back the uranium production there. And of course, now the hunt is on for who is responsible. The Iranians, of course, pointing the finger at their old enemy. And right, they're pointing the finger at Israel. Are they the likely culprit, given the history between the two countries and Israel's capabilities? I mean, I think yes is a simple answer to that. I mean, the, the Israelis have not responded. They haven't said anything. They never do. Um, but if you ask yourself the simple question, qui bono, who benefits? Uh, the answer is obviously the Israelis. The Israeli Prime Minister, even today, speaking alongside Lloyd Austin, the new U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, made it very clear that Israel will not tolerate a nuclear weaponized uh, Iran. Now, Iran's always said it's in, it's enrichment program is not about weapons, uh, it's just about nuclear power. Israel doesn't believe it. Israel knows that Iran has threatened to wipe Israel off the map, uh, and therefore it sees it as an existential threat, and it will do what it takes to try and set back their development of this enriched uranium, which is used to make nuclear weapons. Uh, and so, yes, it would seem obvious uh, that Israel did carry it out, but Israel has absolutely adamantly denied that. And of course, this isn't an isolated incident. There have been other incidents at this plant, at other plants. Remember, there was this attack against an Iranian ship uh, in the Red Sea last week. There was a limpet mine there. Uh, it's believed that there is this kind of low-level war of attrition being conducted, certainly by Israel. Israel has uh, openly admitted that it targets Iranian ships of weapons that are going through Syria, for example, towards Hezbollah, which is sponsored by Iran, inside Lebanon. Uh, so it is the old enemy. It's enemy 
number one, and the Israelis have made it clear that they will act if they feel that they are threatened. And of course, this all comes at a really sensitive time as the U.S. seeks to revive the Iran nuclear deal. Do you think that this attack could threaten those talks? I think that's the key question at the moment. I mean, apart from who did it and how was it done, which is fascinating, but unfortunately we probably won't know the answer to that for a very long time. Uh, the really important diplomatic question, the political question, is what impact it has on those very, very delicate talks. Uh, and the question uh, will not really be answered until we see them sit down around the table, not directly, but in Vienna in the coming days. Ian Panel reporting in from London for us. Thanks so much, Ian. And when we come back, the investigation now underway after a traffic stop involving an Army lieutenant in uniform ends with him being pepper sprayed. The Georgia lawmaker, who at one time faced charges for this incident, caught on camera as the controversial Georgia voting rights bill was signed into law. She is now speaking out what she thinks of the accusations that the bill contents have been misrepresented. But up next, our closer look at greenwashing and the companies that claim they're eco-friendly but now face pushback with criticism saying they're not practicing what they preach. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Walking a mile in people's boots and buying a boot pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. Breaking Bobby Bones, new series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. That is the kind of video right there that no neighbor wants to see on their surveillance camera. Seven people, including children, were inside this L.A. home when it exploded. The roof literally landed on a neighbor's front lawn two doors down. One person remains in critical condition. Fire officials believe a gas leak is to blame. As the threat posed by climate change becomes more pressing, many companies say that they are embracing efforts to go green, but some are now accused of so-called greenwashing, with critics saying that their actions don't actually live up to their public pronouncements of sustainable or environmentally friendly practices. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze takes a look. Patagonia says its mission has been clear since it was launched by diehard rock climber Yvonne Chouinard nearly five decades ago. Do its part to save the planet. 
Today, as the head of Patagonia's apparel division, Jenna Johnson helps oversee that commitment to sustainability. We hire internal experts who manage this process, and it costs money. From the first seed to the store shelf, she says the company goes through a painstaking and costly process to ensure products and suppliers meet standards, like using 100% organic cotton. When we buy that fiber, it has been third party approved to meet all the standards that are necessary, which goes all the way down to soil management, animal management. Johnson says many companies don't do that work or pay the price to enforce sustainable and ethical production, even if they say they do. It's a growing practice called greenwashing. How often in the process of going to find your suppliers to make apparel do you find out the companies are greenwashing where they're saying they're doing one thing and really they're not actually doing it? It happens a lot. There's a lot of really strong marketing claims and a lot of products out there that feel um, fantastic and like they're moving in the right direction in terms of responsibility. But as you dig in, you find sometimes that it's more talk um, than actual actions. One recent study from an international consumer protection group found 40% of companies were guilty of greenwashing, making misleading claims about being eco-friendly. Now the Treasury Department, Federal Reserve, CFTC and SEC have created new climate change units, and the acting chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission is calling for clear guidelines for how to judge companies that claim to make decisions based on environmental, social and governance factors, also known as ESG. It's time to move from the question of if to the more difficult question of how we obtain disclosure on climate. And the Federal Trade Commission, which enforces false or misleading advertising claims, is facing a first-of-its-kind complaint against oil giant Chevron for alleged greenwashing. So we're hoping that the FTC under this administration takes this complaint seriously and holds Chevron accountable. In the complaint, Greenpeace and two other advocacy groups allege Chevron misleads consumers with ads like this, touting its positive environmental impact. Working to provide an alternative source of power for a cleaner way forward. The complaint says Chevron is greenwashing by spending millions of dollars on ads while investing less than 0.2% of its capital expenditures on renewable energy sources. The second most polluting company in the world should not be running multi-million dollar ads telling consumers that they are good for the environment. In a statement to ABC News, Chevron called the allegations frivolous, saying it's investing $3 billion between 2021 and 2028 to advance the energy transition. A Chevron spokesman added, we are taking action to reduce the carbon intensity of our operations and assets, increase the use of renewables and offsets in support of our business, and invest in low carbon technologies to enable commercial solutions. Allegations of greenwashing are extending to Wall Street, too. Tarek Fancy was formerly the chief investment officer for sustainable investing at BlackRock, which manages nearly $9 trillion in assets. When I looked across the data of the world's biggest asset manager, it, it started to become obvious to me that being responsible as a company is not actually that profitable. He says too often Wall Street is greenwashing the public and investors, talking about ESG values, but taking little concrete action on climate change. You know, my concern is that when they say that they're doing a bunch of things that are really helpful and the public believes that it creates a placebo effect where we delay action and, you know, every year matters at this point. So what can be done? What's the solution here? I think, honestly, it's the only way you can aggressively attack the climate crisis is through government action. In a statement to ABC News, BlackRock agreed with the need for stricter government enforcement to avoid greenwashing, saying BlackRock believes greenwashing is a risk to investors and detrimental to the asset management industry's credibility, which is why we strongly support regulatory initiatives to set consistent standards and increase transparency for sustainable portfolios. This kind of oversight won't happen overnight. The FTC has a green guide that provides a framework for how companies can make environmental claims in advertising. It says brands shouldn't call something eco-friendly without offering more details and defines specific terms like recyclable, non-toxic or made with renewable energy.
But the FTC hasn't updated the guide since 2012, and it still doesn't include terms like sustainable that don't have a strict definition. Mary Engel was the head of advertising practices at the FTC for 18 years. It can create a race to the bottom where if one company is touting environmental advantages that it doesn't actually support, other companies may want to do the same thing. She says government standards have helped set the bar for terms like organic and that more regulations could be needed when it comes to green marketing. But she says it's also up to consumers to scrutinize the products they're buying. What would you say to people who want to buy products that are sustainable? How can they make sure that they are in the first place? So I think if you're looking to buy a green product, look for the company to be saying, why is this green? What is it bringing? Is it, is it because it's less packaging waste? Is it because it's recyclable? Really look for those details. Patagonia's Jenna Johnson says consumers increasingly want businesses to care about climate change and the environment. But it'll take a bigger push to see meaningful change. There's a really big groundswell right now for transparency and for responsibility in both environmental and social work being done within business. And I really believe that capitalism and specifically how we do business has to evolve if we want to have a planet that's worth living on. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. Our thanks to Elizabeth for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the personal yet separate statements from Prince William and Harry about their grandfather and what we're now learning about the funeral. They are used in everything from cars to PlayStations, and now the Biden administration is sounding the alarm about the global semiconductor shortage. Why this matters to you. And the number of American children living exclusively with their mothers is growing. We take a look by the numbers. The first our tweet of the day, the Minnesota Twins, one of several teams canceling their games due to the tension surrounding the latest police involved shooting. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you the the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. Devil, never. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. There's one more huge twist. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show. ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. 
Welcome back, everyone. And now to a new Census Bureau study of the living arrangements of America's children. More than ever, kids are living only with their mothers, but there's also a growing number of American children living exclusively with their fathers. Here's a closer look by the numbers. 70% of American children under the age of 18 live with two parents, regardless of marital status, as according to the Census Bureau's current population survey of 2020 data. Whereas back in 1968, 85% of kids in the U.S. lived with two parents. Parents. Today, 21% of American children, that's 15.3 million children, live with just their mother. That's double the number and share from 1968 when 7.6 million children, or 11%, live solely with their mom. And a far greater share of U.S. children now live exclusively with their fathers. It's 4.5%, which means 3.3 million children, still a relatively small number, but it's actually up just 1% of children who lived only with their fathers in 1968. 1968, according to the census. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime tonight. The former Kansas City Chiefs assistant coach now charged with a DWI after that tragic accident involving a five-year-old just before the Super Bowl. And with several states now planning to follow in Georgia's footsteps, we speak with the lawmaker who at one point faced charges for how she opposed her state's bill. But first, to look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Rich. We taught all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. This week, the countdown to Oscar is on. And nobody does it like GMA. The anticipation, the nominees, and surprises. They're nice. I really like this. This week, get your Oscar on with ABC's Good Morning America. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Center police releasing this body camera video of when police say an officer intended to use her taser and instead accidentally shot her gun, killing 20 year old Dante Wright. There was a struggle, and as Wright tries to get into his car, the officer can be heard yelling, Taser, Taser. taser, taser, taser. But the chief of police saying the officer fired her gun instead. The officer heard saying she just shot him. This appears to me from what I viewed and the officer's reaction in distress immediately after, 
that this was an accidental discharge. Overnight, protesters took to the streets. All this just miles away from the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin for the death of George Floyd. The judge says the jury will not be sequestered in light of the traffic stop death. Witnesses today included Philonis Floyd, George's brother. He was so much of a, a leader to us in the household. He will always make sure that we had our clothes for school. He made sure that we all were going to be uh, to school on time. What are you, a specialist? What are you? I'm a lieutenant. It's the traffic stop seen millions of times on social media. Back in December, U.S. Army 2nd Lieutenant Karan Nazaria, behind the wheel of his newly purchased SUV, still dressed in his Army fatigues. And the police say they pulled him over because his vehicle was missing a rear license plate. But as you can see right here, it had a temporary license plate displayed in the back. I'm honestly afraid to get out. Can I yeah, you ask you what's going on? When he refuses to leave the car, the officer, who is now fired, pulls out the pepper spray. Hold on. Watch it. Watch it. According to the lieutenant, when they get him out of the car, they beat him to the ground. He was released with no charges and is now suing the police in federal court. Windsor police announced that Officer Joe Gutierrez has been fired. Prosecutors filed criminal charges today against former Kansas City Chief Assistant Coach Britt Reed for the drunk driving crash that severely injured a five-year-old girl. Officials released the booking photo late this afternoon. He's expected to be released on a $100,000 bail. Reed told police he had two or three drinks and had taken Adderall before the crash. The crash happened three days before the Super Bowl. Reed is the son of Chiefs head coach Andy Reed. Another massive eruption today from a volcano on the island of St. Vincent. That eruption was the biggest one yet and sent solidified lava flowing down the mountain. The volcano first erupted last Friday and much of the island has been covered with toxic ash. Evacuations continue today with at least three cruise ships serving as emergency shelters. Now, the good news is that there have been no injuries or deaths reported. These chips, these wafers, our batteries, broadband, it's all infrastructure. A global shortage of those chips due to pandemic pandemic related supply chain disruptions is causing major issues for the production of computers, cell phones, video gaming systems. Ford and General Motors cutting production at plants in North America, a pause in manufacturing that's raising big concerns about inventory and a potential surge in car prices. Only 12% of global chip manufacturing happens here in the U.S. President Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan calls for a $50 billion investment in semiconductor manufacturing and research. Search. A tribute to the late Prince Philip continued to come in. My dear papa was, uh, was a very special person who I think above all else would have been amazed by the reaction. Prince William this morning releasing a touching tribute to his grandfather, describing the joy and sense of adventure he shared with his great grandchildren, including a sweet photo of Philip with Prince George. William writing, I will miss my grandpa, but I know he would want us to get on with the job. And Prince Harry, who has been in the U.S. with wife Meghan, paying tribute to Philip in his own statement, master of the barbecue, legend of banter, and cheeky right till the end. The Wall Street Journal reported that over the weekend, dozens of CEOs gathered on a Zoom call to plan a new push on voting legislation, coordinating what big businesses should do next about a wave of new voting laws across the country that critics say impose new requirements on access to the ballot box. Georgia has been, of course, at the center of the debate after the state legislature and the state's Republican Governor Brian Kemp passed its new voting law, SB 202, last month. That prompted this scene in the Georgia state capitol as Democratic state Representative Park Cannon repeatedly knocked on Governor Kemp's office door as he signed the new law in a closed door ceremony. Cannon was then forcibly removed from the state house and arrested by state troopers. We are joined now by Representative Cannon and her attorney, Gerald Griggs. Thank you both for being here. Now, we've all seen those images of you trying to enter that closed door signing. Uh, what prompted you to take that action? And, and were you surprised that it led to your arrest, given you repeatedly told the state troopers that you were a legislator and, and and should have the right to be there. Thank you for having us. And as you said, I'm a legislator. This is my job. I serve as the caucus secretary and am normally present for bill signings. This was like any other day at the state capitol. 
where we're debating important measures and our voices deserve to be heard. And you had faced charges for obstructing law enforcement and disrupting a general assembly session, but Fulton County ZA said that they will not bring the case. Are you satisfied that your name has been cleared or will you take further action over your arrest? Thank you for that option. You know, we're looking at all of the options we have. At this moment, I am expressly thankful to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. They did a complete and thorough investigation, which is why our name has been cleared. In this moment, we know there are so many ways that voting rights are being suppressed. So we're just glad and a little bit have an exhale moment as we continue to fight against voter suppression. And uh, Gerald Griggs like to bring you in on this. As a legislator, did she have the right to be there? And, and what are your thoughts now as far as pursuing legal action going forward? Yeah, she had an absolute right to be there. Uh, under the Georgia Constitution, she would be free from arrest uh, during the legislative session. And again, all options, all legal options are on the table. Uh, we are satisfied that the district attorney dismissed the charges, but she should have never been arrested in the first place. And we will fight uh, with every single legal uh, available um, weapon uh, to clear her name uh, now that we have gotten the charges dismissed. And turning to the voting legislation, opponents of the law, including President Biden, have compared the new law to the Jim Crow era. Governor Kemp has responded to that on Fox News, saying, quote, well, I can truthfully look in the camera and ask my African-American friends and other African-Americans in Georgia to simply find out what's in the bill versus the blank statement of this is Jim Crow or this is voter suppression or this is racist because it's not. Would you say that this is hyperbole at all to compare this law, which actually increases the number of early voting days during primaries and general elections? races to the draconian measures used during the Jim Crow era? Is this law and its impact being misconstrued at all by its opponents? This is Jim Crow 2.0, and we're right on the front lines of it. When you take away the hours that individuals can vote, the locations, the methods, and then you also add criminal penalties for helping other individuals receive human rights issues like water and food, it's very clear that this legislation targets the five million black and brown Georgians, which is why I knocked on that door, which is why we'll keep knocking. Senate Bill 202 is dangerous for Georgia businesses, and that's why you've seen them come out to try to address this at this time. And another point of contention is new requirements for voter identification for absentee ballots. But Republicans say 97 percent of eligible voters have valid ID and simply have to put down their license or ID number with the ballot and that other forms of ID can be submitted for those who don't have ID. Is that less subjective than trying to match signatures? It's really important that we understand in a state like Georgia, where there are so many languages spoken, we are an international state. Therefore, there are communities who do not access their ballots in English. They access them in other languages. Who pays for that? Those are the counties. This bill, Senate Bill 202, takes away the right of county boards of elections to determine what they need in their communities. This is not a great sign for Georgia Georgia, and this is not about exact match. This is about stopping communities from accessing the vote in a way that feels okay to them and in a way that does not obstruct their right. Voting rights are so important for issues just like the one our nation is watching right now, officer-involved shootings and police brutality. Our family and our hearts go out to those involved with Dante Wright, but what we want the community at large to know is this connects to voting rights. These are the same individuals who take away your voting rights, who then propose legislative measures that don't help address the issues with law enforcement and motorists. Just like here in Georgia, we saw this year a piece of legislation that would have put the burden on communities to understand law enforcement instead of the other way around. Just about 30 seconds left. You have said that you are shaken but resolved as far as continuing the fight in Georgia. But I'm curious how you see this playing out in the rest of the country as more states like Texas move forward on new voting laws. There are so many young elected officials around the country, and we speak regularly as ways to determine how do we impact this issue right now. What I will say to all Georgians is, one, we have to keep knocking wherever those doors are, continue that going, and two, 
learn about Senate Bill 202. It is the law. At this point, we do not have an injunction, and we're going to have to comply, learn the rules, and actually play and beat the game. Thank you for having me. Georgia State Representative Park Cannon and Attorney Gerald Griggs, we thank you both for your time. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having us. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look at this. That is Dr. Ayla Stanford. You likely remember her. At the start of the pandemic, she and a group of Philadelphia doctors decided to help expand testing in that city's underserved communities. When the vaccines rolled out, they immediately began the process of providing shots to the same communities. Now she has a street named after her, Dr. Ayla Stanford Way. Lots of excitement and surprise from her this morning. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night. And coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of several things. The curfew now in place. We're continuing to monitor developments out of Minnesota, particularly the outrage following that new fatal shooting called a mistake by police. And the housing market is being described as the hottest in at least 15 years. If you're in the market, we have some tips. History, the first 100 days of Biden. The successes, the challenges, and what we now know from the inside and her story. Two freshman congresswomen from both sides of the aisle, letting you inside their worlds, inside the Capitol, with so much now at stake. See the groundbreaking reports as they go live. Tuesday, streaming on ABC News Live. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Walking a mile in people's boots and buying a new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. We're talking with Oscar nominees, A-listers, and insiders about everything. Inside the Oscars. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The new warning from the CDC director as cases continue to soar, especially in hard hit Michigan. Dr. Walensky warns they can't vaccinate their way out of the surge and they should shut down again to slow the spread. Hospitals there are once again struggling to keep up. Some are more inundated now than at any time during the pandemic. The unvaccinated and young people fueling the spike in Michigan in other states, more than 119 million Americans have received at least one dose of the vaccine. There is an investigation now underway after an Army lieutenant in uniform was pulled over in Virginia for a traffic stop. The officer's guns were drawn and they even sprayed the lieutenant with pepper spray. He's now filed a civil rights lawsuit. One of the officers has been fired. Police in Minnesota released the body camera of the fatal encounter with a motorist that sparked a night of violent protests. Dante Wright could be seen struggling with officers to get back in his car. An officer could be heard yelling taser, but then fires a single shot from her gun, allegedly by mistake. The police chief called the shooting accidental. Tonight, the medical examiner is classifying the death as a homicide. The city is bracing for more demonstrations tonight. And now to the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin. Now in its third week, an emotional day in court. George Floyd's younger brother taking the stand. This, as word comes, deliberations could begin as soon as next week. Alex Perez reports in from Minneapolis. Emotional testimony as the prosecution moves to wrap up their part of the case before the defense gets its turn. The jury today hearing from George Floyd's younger brother, Felonis Floyd, describing this photo. As my mother, she's no longer with us right now, but that's, that's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. In his final moments, George Floyd called out for his mother. On the witness stand today, his brother describing their relationship as one of a kind. He was a big mama's boy. He would lay, just lay up onto her in the fetus position like he was still in a womb. He showed us like uh, how to treat our mom and how to respect our mom. 
he he just he loved her so dearly. The prosecution has called 38 witnesses, 10 of them doctors and other medical experts. Today, cardiologist Jonathan Rich knocking down defense claims Floyd's drug use and heart disease led to his death, saying Floyd would have lived if not for the officers. Do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether Mr. Floyd's death was preventable? Yes, I believe that Mr. George Floyd's death was absolutely preventable. A dozen members of law enforcement have testified against Derek Chauvin. Today, Seth Stoughton, a former officer and an expert on the use of force, summing up what so many others have said. No reasonable officer would have believed that that was an appropriate, acceptable, or reasonable use of force. Our thanks to Alex. And for more analysis, we bring in Shauna Lloyd, civil rights attorney with the Cochran firm in Florida. Thanks so much for joining us again, Ms. Lloyd. We heard those emotional words from George Floyd's brother today. What would you say is the likely impact on the jury, especially after Derek Chauvin's attorney had been highlighting Floyd's drug use and arguing that he had resisted arrest, clearly trying to paint a, a very different picture of him, it seems. Well, having Flonis on the stand today allowed us to humanize George Floyd. It gave him context. It gave him someone who's up there who can talk about his family life, what was important to him. It humanizes him in a different kind of way because this is a family member that has lost someone tragically. At use, of force ex, use of force expert Seth Stoughton talked about what a, quote, reasonable officer would have done in Derek Chauvin's situation. What does reasonable mean here, and what's the legal significance of that word? Well, that's the standard by which this all of his actions will be reviewed, whether or not a reasonable officer at the time would have taken these actions. That's the standard by which we're measuring his behavior to determine whether or not it was an unreasonable use of force. And then it'll also allow them to then determine the charges, which charges is which charge is most applicable to the behavior at hand. So that when you hear that reasonable standard, it's a very important one because it is how he will be measured. And, and there was, of course, another police shooting of a black man, Dante Wright, just miles away from that courthouse. The judge is not sequestering the jury at this time. Do you think that that shooting could impact this trial in any way? I think the judge made a call in the fact that these things are happening. He can't insulate the jury from every particular act by um, putting them under sequestration. The other thing I think he considered is jurors typically do not like to be sequestered away from their friends, their loved ones, their families. So when you look at a case that's going to be this intensive for deliberation, I believe that the judge didn't want to extend how long they would be sequestered because during deliberation, they will be. If they had been sequestered from now, they could be it could have been two weeks and most jurors are going to not go through you know they'll say things like well we just couldn't come to a resolution i think the judge is trying to avoid them being sequestered for that long of a period to ensure that they come to a verdict and, and we haven't really heard about race in the chauvin trial itself yet it was of course front and center of the public outrage that immediately followed floyd's death as a civil rights attorney do you think that race should be explicitly brought up during this trial and even if it's it's not what role does it play, if any? It plays a very large role. I mean, these subtle microaggressions against black and brown people are based in this sort of racism, this subtle um, bias that we have against different persons. Now, whether or not, I don't know in a, in a case like this, there's so much other actual evidence about lack of training, about how reasonable it was. I think that sometimes you can over, over put too much into it and the jury gets distracted. I think they needed to kind of focus because everyone knows that these events events are typically brought about by racial bias. Shauna Lloyd from the Cochran Law Firm, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And back now to that deadly police shooting in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, where we are monitoring protests at this hour. Taking a live look right now at demonstrations in the Twin Cities, police say an officer accidentally shot 20-year-old Dante Wright after thinking that they were using their taser instead of a handgun. Stephanie Ramos reports. Tonight, new body camera video showing the moment a Minnesota officer fatally shot 20-year-old Dante Wright. Police say the female officer, a veteran on the force, accidentally discharged a gun instead of a taser, killing the father of a two-year-old. It is my belief that the officer had the intention to deploy their taser, but instead shot Mr. Wright with a single bullet. This was an accidental discharge that resulted in the tragic death 
of Mr. Wright. The incident beginning just before 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon when authorities say Wright was pulled over for an expired vehicle registration outside of Minneapolis. Wright's girlfriend also in the car. According to the Brooklyn Center Police Department, the officers ran Wright's name through their system, discovering there was a warrant out for his arrest. Court records show that warrant was issued after Wright failed to appear in court earlier this month, following charges of possessing a firearm without a permit and running away from law enforcement. Police say on Sunday, Wright was trying to get back into the vehicle as officers attempted to apprehend him. The officer warning Altasia. Then she pulls a firearm, firing a shot at Wright. The car driving for several blocks before crashing into another vehicle. According to authorities, paramedics tried to save his life, but Wright was pronounced dead at the scene. Tonight, the officer who pulled the trigger is on administrative leave pending an independent investigation. We cannot afford to make mistakes that lead to uh, the loss of life. And so I do fully support uh, releasing the officer of her duties. Overnight, protests erupting. Tensions already high in the city with the trial of Derek Chauvin just 10 miles away. Our hearts are aching right now. We are in pain right now. And we recognize that this couldn't have happened at a worse time. President Biden weighing in. We do know that the anger, pain, and trauma that exists in the black community in that environment is real. It's serious and it's consequential. We should listen to uh, uh, Dante's mom, who is calling for peace and calm. Dante's mother heartbroken. They don't want all of this. All of this. I just want my baby home. That's all I want. Is I want him to be home. I don't want everybody out here chanting and screaming and yelling. I just want him home. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. At least one person is dead and an officer injured after a shooting at a Tennessee high school. The magnet school in Knoxville and surrounding areas were placed under lockdown while investigators were on the scene. The injured officer is said to be conscious and alert. The Tennessee governor asking for prayers for the affected families and victims. At least one person so far has been detained by police. Often the conversations around the topic of infrastructure may make us think of bridges and roads. And while that is part of it, in the digital world, World we live in, it's also these guys. You see them there, those semiconductor chips that play a critical role in so many daily life essentials from our cars to our smartphones. But the global shortage has multiple companies on edge and is President Biden doubling down on his trillion dollar infrastructure plan. ABC's Karen Travers brings us this report from Washington. President Biden today checking in with CEOs from tech companies, electronics manufacturers, and American automakers. Industries that are all competing right now for a scarce but critical resource, semiconductors. These chips, these wafers, our batteries, broadband, it's all infrastructure. A global shortage of those chips due to pandemic-related supply chain disruptions is causing major issues for the production of computers, cell phones, video gaming systems. We are living through now a global chip shortage. We're seeing that hurt. Uh, businesses in every sector. With cars becoming more and more sophisticated, semiconductors are a critical part of auto manufacturing. The chip shortage means serious consequences for the American auto industry. Ford and General Motors cutting production at plants in North America. A pause in manufacturing that's raising big concerns about inventory and a potential surge in car prices. I do think that perhaps some of that demand can shift later in the year. Um, but again, it's not always ideal for car companies because you want to sell that vehicle when the consumer is ready. Only 12% of global chip manufacturing happens here in the U.S. President Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan calls for a $50 billion investment in semiconductor manufacturing and research. The White House downplayed expectations for this summit, saying President Biden wanted to hear from CEOs about what would help them right now. But experts say there is no good short-term solution for this chip shortage. Lindsay? Karen, thank you. We now shift to the death of Prince Philip and new details about his funeral plan for this Saturday, which, of course, due to the pandemic, is expected to be a much smaller ceremony. Both William and Harry released separate statements on the passing of their beloved grandfather. ABC's James Longman brings us the latest from Buckingham Palace. 
Britain is preparing to say goodbye to Prince Philip, but the coronavirus means a more scaled-back event just for family, and that will include Prince Harry flying in especially for his grandfather's funeral. It's the first time he will have seen them in more than a year since he and Meghan served out their final engagements as working royals before stepping back officially from public duties. Meghan very much wanted to come and she was advised by her physician not to travel. Clearly disappointing for her, for Harry, um, but you could say in some ways that her not being here might simplify things in some ways if you're looking at the possibility of a brother-to-brother -brother conversation, for example. The funeral for the 99-year-old prince will be held Saturday in Windsor. Harry is expected to join his his father, Prince Charles, and brother, Prince William, walking behind Philip's casket. A moving reminder of a similar scene from over 20 years ago, when the Duke walked with his grandsons behind their mother, Diana. The princes releasing statements on their grandfather's passing. Prince William sharing this photo of Prince George and Philip, saying, I feel lucky to have not just had his example to guide me, but his enduring presence well into my own adult life. And from Prince Harry, he will be remembered as the longest reigning consort to the monarch, a decorated serviceman, a prince and a duke. But to me, like many of you who have lost a loved one or grandparent over the pain of this past year, he was my grandpa, master of the barbecue, legend of banter, and cheeky right till the end. I love William to bits. He's my brother. We've been through hell together. And we have a shared experience. But we, you know, we were on, we were on different paths. It may be a rocky homecoming. Meghan and Harry alleged in that sit-down with Oprah that, among other things, a member of the royal family made racist remarks about the possible skin colour of their child. Harry said the comment did not come from his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, or his grandfather, but it was a bombshell claim. Can you tell us what the question was? No, I don't, I'm not comfortable sharing that. Okay. Um, but that was, that was right at the beginning, right? Um, like, what will the baby look like? Yeah, what will the kids look like? In rallying around the Queen at this difficult time, the family may find their own differences mended. That is certainly the hope. We are seeing the royal family very united in their grief, and I think that's going to continue to be the case. And it could be an opportunity for them to have discussions and work through some of the real disagreements that have taken place. Our thanks to James for that. Still to come, the massive volcanic explosion rocking a Caribbean island as ash is falling on other islands as far as 100 miles away. And our conversation with the author who thought of a story that took place in a Native American reservation 37 years ago. Now it's a bestseller. It's such a bizarre story. Sometimes I don't even believe that it happened to me. The betrayal was just unimaginable. I don't even have words for that kind of evil. I've written over 30 crime novels, but this story, it baffles me. Here's the thing, we as human beings think that no one can really read us, but we kind of can read other people. The more we think that, the more we get it wrong. The devil never sleeps. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. When they arrived, they found a very grisly scene. There was no signs of forced entry. Winger said he found Harrington beating his wife with a hammer, and to save her, he shot Harrington twice in the head. The detectives came to the conclusion that Mark Winger acted in self-defense, and the case was closed within approximately 48 hours. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. And in comes this young, beautiful nanny who wants to help out this poor man. Show Grandma how you stand in your crib. And it was my purpose to make this family whole again. Mark and I eloped. We went to Maui. Now they're going to Hawaii and getting married? Like, seriously? Can I say it on camera? What the f I'm sorry, but seriously. There's something going on here that we missed. Was this the moment when Mark went from thinking about murder, maybe even fantasizing about murder, and realized, I can maybe pull it off? I never thought my husband was a diabolical 
murderer. Now Friday night, new interviews, stunning details. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. This is just taking a turn for the surreal. The all new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The devil never sleeps. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. The most powerful volcanic explosion yet has rocked the Caribbean island of St. Vincent. The blast was so powerful, the mountain's dome or its top collapsed, bringing with it a violent mix of ash, rocks and gas, destroying everything in its path. Nearly 20,000 have been evacuated so far. It's unclear when these eruptions may finally end. Iran is blaming Israel for sabotage and threatening revenge after one of its major nuclear sites was hit by an explosion. The blast has curbed Iran's ability to enrich uranium that could be used for nuclear weapons, which Iran denies. The Israelis so far have said no comment, but the U.S. re-emphasized that Israel remains a strategic partner. Indirect talks between the U.S. and Iran on rejoining the nuclear deal so far will continue. And in London, they were calling it Manic Monday. Finally, some positive news on the COVID front. In the U.K., people were allowed to go back to pubs and restaurants for the first time in months with strict COVID restrictions now loosening due to the combination of lockdowns and vaccinations. Now to the skyrocketing housing market here in the U.S. A mix of record-breaking demand in homes and short supply is now triggering bidding wars around the country. Even Google searches for should I buy a house and sell my home are at all-time highs. ABC's Becky Worley brings us this report. With the housing market red hot, prospective buyers are trying not to get burned as demand soars, but supply is limited. Home prices rising at their highest rate in 15 years, up 11.2%. And demand so intense that Redfin reports nearly half of homes are selling within a week of hitting the market. That's a record. The market is crazy right now. The spike, a result of the pandemic, as more people work from home, mortgage rates drop, and millions of millennials now enter their home buying years. But people with dreams of owning a home could be in for a rude awakening. Just over 1 million homes available for sale now, compared to a peak of more than 4 million at the height of the last housing bubble in 2007. Newlyweds Alexander Tieran and Alexia Schaefer were outbid on homes five different times since they started their home search last month. We kept seeing houses on the market that would be gone within some of them literally 24 hours. With a little patience and luck, they finally landed a home within their budget. We were outbid and then their uh, other buyer fell through and they went with our offer secondarily. It's relief. We need to come up with a number that works for everyone so I can get this deal done today. Million dollar listing agent Tracy Tudor says despite the competition, now is the best time to buy a new home. Because the interest rates are so historically low, know what you're getting into and make sure you secure that interest rate now because you will not find it again. A secret tip for buyers, use an escalation clause. In an escalation clause, you can say, my buyer is willing to pay $5,000 more than the highest offer you have. And then you can cap that. And most importantly, find out what the seller really wants. Every seller has different needs and wants and desires. Make sure that your broker is reaching out to the listing broker and asking them the types of terms that their seller is actually looking for. You'd be surprised. That can kind of put it over the edge. All other things considered equal. Our thanks to Becky for that. Now, what does it take to be an overnight success for writer Angeline Bully? It started with the germ of an idea while in high school that wasn't published for 37 years, all while working full time and raising three children. Now at 55 years old, Bully has published her first book, Firekeeper's Daughter, which has become an instant hit, reaching number one on the New York Times young adult bestsellers list. Angeline Bully joins us now. First, congratulations on your success. Yes, your book, Firekeeper's Daughter, is the story of a teenage Ojibwe girl named Donis Fontaine who helps investigate an undercover drug ring threatening her community. The book takes place on a Native American reservation, a place quite familiar to you as a member of the Ojibwe tribe. Tell me about your background, which is similar to Donis's. 
Well, uh, you know, light skinned native girl and my father's Ojibwe. My mom is non-native. And so I grew up hearing a lot of things like, oh, you don't look native or, you know, just different things of people who don't really fully understand that there's so much uh, diversity in being native. And um, yeah, so I'm similar to Donis in that way. And before you became a full-time author, you had a career in education, working with Native American communities and also for the federal government, all the while raising two sons and a daughter, a full and busy life. What made you decide to write this book for so many years and what little spare time you had and, and what need do you see this book fulfilling? Well, um, I just, my daughter was a preteen and I think that really propelled me to sit down and write this story that had been in my mind uh, since I was 18 about a young Ojibwe woman who, you know, has a native, a native father, non-native mother, and ends up getting pulled into this undercover investigation. And at first, you know, you think she's an ordinary Ojibwe girl, and then you find out there's so much more to her, and it actually makes her the ideal confidential informant for the FBI. But then she starts thinking about is protecting her community the same thing as helping the FBI? Because uh, it seems like there's really two investigations going on, theirs and hers. Really interesting read. And in reading Firekeepers, Dirt, I was struck that not only does the book feature a Native American protagonist, but also that you include a lot of Native dialogue as well. Why was that important to you in creating Donis's world? Because Donis grew up with the language, and so that's just a part of how she thinks. And so I wrote the book wanting the language to be very organic. I purposely didn't have a glossary because I thought if it's organic, it's written in first person point of view. So you are inside Donis's head. And of course she's gonna, you know, have the language peppered in there. And um, so that's, you know, and I, my goal was that it would be organic and people would be able to figure it out through the context. And lastly, what would you hope that audiences take away from Firekeeper's Daughter? Whether they buy the book because it's a gorgeous cover designed by Ojibwe artist Moses Lunham, or because they've heard, you know, read a review, or it's on Reese's book club pick, uh, young adult pick for spring. Um, whatever reason they pick up the book, what I hope stays with them is a greater understanding of what it is to be Native. Uh, today, in these times, we are still here. We have dynamic stories to tell. Author Angeline Bully, thank you so much for your time. And once again, congratulations. Uh, miigwech. Thank you so much. And before we go, we were struck today by the images from around the world of Muslims marking the start of this year's holy month of Ramadan. This is the second Ramadan taking place during the pandemic. But this year, vaccines are creating a degree of hope that more family gatherings and group prayers might be possible. Our best to all those observing and fasting in the days ahead. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.